My name is Karen Rasher. I'm here today to talk about how we can use risk communication, the science of risk communication or hazards communication, um, in some useful ways and when we talk about climate change. I have been lucky enough to be funded by the Water Research Foundation. I want to really thank them for their support for this project. And I also really want to point out that all the research we've done is very pragmatic. We have this great group of we have this great group of water utilities that have really made sure that our research is very grounded in pragmatism and usefulness to them. So risk communication, when you think about risk communication or hazard communication, you usually think about talking to people in times of a real disaster. There's been a hurricane, there's a big disease outbreak. People are emotional, things are hard for them and how do you talk to them about this? Well. We know that there are times when you're talking about climate change that there also becomes a threat. People feel threatened. Um, climate change is a very polarized conversation in the United States, and people are very social animals. We cannot live alone. We must live in groups. And therefore, if you threaten my ability to be a part of my group, to be a part of my faith-based organization, my public, um, my political organization, you threaten my ability to be a human being, to my basic survival. You threaten my ability to be a part of the group. You also, climate change has been described as a wicked problem, a problem that has a number of complex scientific issues that have to be not only understood, this, you not only have to understand the science, but you have to have the capability to apply it. You have to um, engage in an issue that is often far away and not of particular impact to you right now where you are. Um, and you, you could threaten my ability to be a good decision maker when you talk about climate change. Um, as we know, good decision making is a basis of our society. Our economy is based on the idea that everybody's going to make the right decision, a good decision about what they buy, um, how they act. Um, and of course, if you were making a good decision, you would be a scientist, which most of you are. Um, you'd use statistics and probability. You'd be able to apply the scientific method. You make, might make a hypothesis about climate change, gather information about it, have a feedback loop. Um, you'd be, as we said earlier, you have this ability to apply basic scientific, scientific literacy to the problem, um, and you'd have a global sense of of time. Um, however, human beings are not designed to make good decisions. We are neurologically wired when we see the hippo to God damn it, run as fast as you can and get out of there. You're not going to think about, I wonder what the statistics of people being killed by hippos are. Or I wonder if I make the hypothesis that this hippo might catch up to me, do I need his run speed to be able to decide that? No. As human beings, this is our basic neurological wiring when we communicate. We get the hell out of there. Um, the research base in um, risk communication and hazards communication is science-based. People have done MRI studies looking at when people are threatened, what happens to the conversation in the brain. And what they've found is the moment that you introduce a threat it moves the discussion from the frontal lobe, which is where we have rational discourse, to the back of our brain, which is a more primitive processing center. And when you do that, you create stress, emotion, and a great deal of mental noise. So remember, anytime you're talking to somebody who has an emotional response to what you say, you now have to get through these three things before they can hear anything that you say. And remember, at the same time, when you're having an emotional debate with somebody, you're going to the primitive place as well. That you are no longer engaged in a reasoned discourse when you feel emotional about what happens, when you're getting beat up. So I want to talk about a very specific kind of conversation that we have as climate um, specialist scientists. And that is those critical conversations. Those times when if you don't talk about climate change, a desired outcome is not going to occur. Um, and that happens, um, I recently had a phone call, I'm doing water utility work, I recently had a phone call from a water utility planner. They had spent a year 
downscaling um, climate models to their region, really making a range of predictions of how droughts were going to change in the future, both in terms of severity and magnitude. They'd done lots of research on how they could diversify their supply portfolios so that they could have enough water in the future. And they were going to senior management to present their ideas. They, this group of people were extremely excited. They get in the room, they start presenting, and one of the most senior people in the room, about 10 minutes in, stands up and says, I don't believe in climate change. He said, you could have heard a pin drop. The air in the room was literally sucked out. So instead of them having this really exciting opportunity to share information, they were all in the emotional place. There was no longer the ability to have a reasoned discourse. And what happened was they spent about another 10, 15 minutes kind of talking, not quite sure what to say. Everybody left. And the utility is no longer even able to have the conversation about how to prepare for droughts in the future. This has huge consequences to their customers. They may not run out of water in 10 to 20 years. So I want to talk about those kinds of critical conversations. For those of you who are, on who, um, are not interested in applying this, remember, a critical conversation also is you've been invited to an AGU conference in the beautiful mountains of the Rocky Mountains. Your wife really, or, other, or a partner, wants to go to the beach for vacation. And you need to engage in a critical conversation with them to help them realize how important it is to come to the Rocky Mountains. So this kind of um, critical conversation occurs all the time in all kinds of conversations. And typically what we do as humans is not talk about it. So critical conversations are always high-risk conversations. Because a critical conversation, you have, you have some outcome you need that you have to go to the emotional place. And we don't like to do that. So the objective of a critical conversation and about how I'm, this kind of template I'm going to give you is you want to replace that emotional reaction both in yourself and in the person you're communicating with with the ability to go back to that reason discourse. You want to have a response to the senior manager that acknowledges him, but also provides the opportunity to not get stuck in that emotional response. Now note that I am not talking about when the Heartland Institute is beating you up. I'm talking about when you're having a real conversation with someone. Um, and the goal of it, this, the only way to do this, because remember, you're going to the emotional place too. So is to anticipate those kinds of situations, prepare for them, and actually practice it. So when you're standing there kind of shaking about this emotional response, that this emotional conversation you've gotten yourself into, you know exactly what to do. And so normally when I do this, I get a half an hour rather than 15 minutes. And we would actually break up. And I would have small groups of you identify an opportunity where you might get yourself beat up in an emotional conversation and, where, and to actually prepare what you would say and to practice it. So what I would encourage that, I have um, encourage you to, at some other opportunity in this weekend, to find a group and do that because it's really quite fun. Um, the research that I'm using is based on Dr. Vincent Cavella, who's the founder and director of the Center for Risk Communication. I really encourage you to just Google him. He has lots of presentations um, um, with audio on them on the website, on the internet, and he is a brilliant speaker. If you ever have a chance to hear him speak, he's much more fun than I am. Um, he worked with um, Mayor Giuliano. When he, or Giuliani, when he was first um, in office. And Giuliani called him and said, tell me, what are the 10 most likely horrible things to happen to New York while I'm here? And prepare speaking points for me. Tell me how to respond to this. So many people think that he did a wonderful job after 9-11 with his communication. And that is because he had already anticipated what horrible things could happen. He had prepared what he was going to say, and he had actually practiced with the fire department, the police department, all the other agencies. And so his response, his communication strategy was already in place. Um, I have a number of these templates that he provides. What have I done with my clicker? Here it is. 
And if anybody wants them, I'm sharing. I'm happy to share them. He talks about the need to have a 2793 prepared. If you look at any headline in any journal or anything, there's no more than 27 words. You can read it or speak it in nine seconds, and there's no more than three points. Make sure that, you're, you're, that you use that. Um, rule of three, people need to hear things three times before they get it. Primacy regency, say the most important thing first, say it again at the end. Say it in the middle, then you've got, all th you've got your rule of three. Um, like I said, he has this whole group of templates, and I only have time to share one with you today. And it is the caring, sharing, sharing template. He has these little templates, makes it easy, you can fill in the blanks. You, this is one that he recommends you use when you're responding to a comment or question that contains misinformation. This is something that happens to us as climate specialists all the time. And the idea is remember, you've now gone to the emotional place. You cannot engage with that person until you engage with them emotionally. This doesn't mean you have to say, oh my god, I'm so sorry, I hurt your feelings. No, you can just actually make some kind of a connection with them about something you both, both care about. And for the water practitioner, that is, we're both here today to plan to make sure that in the droughts in the future, we have adequate, safe supplies of water for our customers. You've now made this emotional connection with this person. You then, and this is important that you really feel this, you can't make this up. You have to really say, I want information from you too. I need to understand from you where you're getting your information, what's important to you, because as a communicator, the most important thing you will ever do as a communicator is understand your audience. And you provide them with the opportunity to give you what you really need, an understanding of where they're getting information, what's important to them. And then you can reshare your statement, and then you've, you've made an emotional connection, you've told them you care and you're interested, you state your, your opinion. You can then move on with the conversation. You're no longer stuck in that dead silence, that vacuum of, oh my God, what do we say now? So I'm going to give you a very, very quick example. Um, this is my colleague who's a senior um, person in their water utility. She has stood up and said, very nicely, not everybody says this quite this nicely, I don't believe in climate change. We are both here today to ensure that our customers have safe, adequate supplies of water. Very short, no big deal, but we've made an emotional connection, the two of us. I have facts I want to share with you, but I'm also really interested in what your facts are and where you got them. And I hope before we leave today that you will give me a piece of paper with those on them or send me an email. I can give you my card so that I can get access to that information. Don't get stuck in asking them right now. Provide them with an opportunity to share that with you later. And then one of the best ways is to state with conviction what you feel and provide three sources. Very few people then will respond negatively to that. I'm convinced, based on the scientific um, consensus at the AGU conference I was recently at, that climate change is occurring. Now again, this is important when you're thinking, when you're preparing this. Remember, you're anticipating this, preparing this, practicing. Think about who you're going to do this with. If you're doing this at church, a good source of would be the religious um, organizations of America believe in climate change. Um, so choose your sources so that they resonate with your audience. If they have no idea who the IPCC is, don't use that as a source. It's not helpful. Um, and basically, you just go on, list your source, maybe give a little bit of information. Don't get too stuck in this conversation. You're just basically saying, I, I have a strong conviction that this is true. I want to share this conviction with you so that we can move on and, and reach the end that we want. And in, in the case of my example, the end is we can continue our conversation about how to prepare for a new kind of drought. Um, and basically, that's the care, share, share template. He has a number of them that you can apply to different situations. I encourage you to be prepared, to anticipate when you're going to be in these kinds of situations, prepare for it, 
and practice it. Because remember, if you're in an emotional state, you have to bring yourself to the reason discourse as well. Thank you.